today's release will be devoted to an interesting physical phenomenon. Some people call it a neutron star, others call it sonoluminescence. If you create certain conditions in a test tube, then there will be born a small luminous bubble. We will tell you how to assemble and configure the system. So, sit back, we begin. One wonderful day when I was surfing YouTube, I found a video about an interesting phenomenon, which is based on the glow of the bubble due to the acoustic effect. After reviewing the video several times that it's easy to recreate such a phenomenon, a week later on my desk there were all the necessary parts for assembling an operating installation. The principle of the device is quite simple. The signal from the generator is fed to the piezoceramic emitters, which are glide to a test tube with water. The wave amplitude in the system is regulated by a variable inductor connected in series with piezoceramic, a resonant LC circuit informed. Then we place an air bubble in the chamber. We find the resonance. The shock waves act on the bubble and it glows. But in reality, Everything turned out to be not so simple. As my father says, don't count your chickens before they hatched. We spent six months on solving some test tubes. In this particular case, we are interested in round bottom flasks. They will be an acoustic camera. How to choose the right one? Anyhow. So we ordered several types of such tanks from Soviet options to ultra modern ones. The best result was shown by a round-bottomed flask of the Czech company Cymax, with a volume of 100 ml. It is a bit oval, but its glass is the same of thickness everywhere. The very first experiments were carried out with flasks with half a liter capacity. They were sold at the grandfather's market, so I didn't have to choose the volume. The manufacturer is the Juzhna Gorka plant, the oldest enterprise in its industry, which has excited since 1801. So, we figured out the dishes for the acoustic camera. Next, we can see the piezo ceramics. With like dynamics, we'll swing a crowd of atoms and molecules in the volume of water. For reference, the piezoelectric effect was discovered by Jacques and Pierre Curie in, in 1880. The effect is manifested in the deformation of a material placed in an electric field, and vice versa. On the market, piezo ceramics vary in size and shape. The ideal option was a solid washer without any holes, with a diameter of 22 mm and a thickness of 4 mm. During the experiments, a large piezo ceramic with a diameter of 50 mm and a thickness of 6.5 mm was tested. The next step in creating an acoustic chamber is the connection of piezo ceramics with the test tube. Before doing this, solder the wires to the washers. The contacts in the Soviet samples are silver-plated, therefore they darken it somewhat from time. We clean the surface to a mirror shine. All markings and inscriptions on the metal are visible now. We will solder the wires using acid and a powerful soldering iron. You need to do this with one quick touch, so that nothing is overheated. Wires must be flexible. Fine silver spraying is very delicate to external loads. For symmetrical placement of piezo emitters, you need to mark the flask. All of the materials at hand. Square and marker, twist the flask and mark the middle. Cut a small piece of wire or treat which is equal to the circumference of our bulb. Now, 
we measure the length of the treat and fix the result. 34 cm. Divide this length by 2 and get 17 cm. Put a mark. Next, combine it with the mark on the flask. Now, on one of the three ends of the wire, it remains to mark the place where emitters will be placed strictly symmetrically relative to each other. It's time to attach the emitters. We will do this using two-component epoxy glide. The time of complete solidification is about a day. We squeeze out the contents of the tubes in the proportions one to one. Then mix thoroughly. In my understanding, the glass should be trans transparent. Therefore, during the experiments, at least three types of such two-component resins were tried, and all of them showed a good result. Prior to application, surfaces must be degreased with the alcohol or acetone. So, the acoustic cameras are ready. Work on creating each takes about two days. Now, these vessels can be filled with water and we can try to get neutron stars. But there is another very important point. We need not just simple water, but special one. Prepared in advance with a certain temperature. Understanding only this stage took about three months of my life. For the experiment, I mainly used water after osmosis. If there is no filter, distilled water can be used. Pour liquid with a margin into a clean bowl. This stage can be called degassing. Ideally, it is good to use a vacuum chamber, but I don't have it. Therefore, we boil the liquid for 30 minutes. Pour water into a container for food. It must be leak-proof. Now the water needs to cool. Place the container in cold water about 10 minutes. At this time carefully wash the acoustic chamber. It should be transparent like a tear. We put the contents in the freezer. We need a temperature of about 5 degrees. It is important. Otherwise sonoluminescence can be observed. What is the reason for this? I do not know. We fill a test tube pour so that there are as few air bubbles as possible. So, here it is, the right resonant camera with the right water, perfectly transparent, cold and spherical lens in which 10 out of 10 attempts were successful. Now, what you should do and how it usually ends. If you simply take water from the tap or from the filter without further degassing, then an observed result we will this. The first attempts to degas water were carried out on a previously prepared stand with the participation of distillate and dry alcohol. To prevent dust particles from entering the water, a cap was put on top. Boiling water is still an exciting activity. Here you can see all the exciting flaws on the headed substance. The result of such boiling naturally did not lead to anything good. Since the neck of the tube was not hermetically closed, Water gained air and became unsuitable for the continuation of the experiment. So, we already know how to prepare water. At a low water temperature, condensation will begin to form on the walls of the flask. It will interfere the experiment, so we stock up on napkins. We managed to get a neutron star at temperature from 
5 to 15 degrees Celsius. At 10 degrees, the glow was the most bright. Below 5 and above 15 degrees of glow was hardly observed. A resonance chamber is installed. Acoustic waves act on the bubble. Turn off the light and see a rare phenomenon with the formation of a teeny neutron star. So register the phenomenon on the camera. You need to install a black background and get hold of a fast lens. My old ultrasound turned out to be almost blind when shooting this phenomenon. For this reason, the project was frozen for about six months before new filming equipment was bought. So, we pass to the generator and control system of the experiment setup. At first, I decided to take a proven circuit from the ultrasonic bath. Here both the frequency can be adjusted and the power to get about 60 watts. When working at large capacities, problems arose immediately. The first start of the installation, by mistake, was made with an empty test tube. When tuning the frequency, the glass at some point went into resonance and cracked. I didn't want to make a new flask. I need to repair the old one. We insert a piece of glass to where it fell from and fill it with the epoxy on top. With shortage of information, it seemed to me that the acoustic resonance in the flask was directly related to the mechanical resonance of the piezo ceramics. But the fact is that it will be different for each type of the piezo ceramics. So we see a stable air bubble in the flask. Under the influence of acoustic waves, it contracted to such an extent that sometimes it simply disappeared from the view. Sometimes it began to reflect light. The amplitudes of the voltage at the emitters reached such values that ordinary ferret inside the inductor began to shock, leaving small traces of burns on the fingers. At the same time, a neon bulb starts to shine even before touching the emitter. After numerous unsuccessful attempts to obtain a neutron star, I wondered what would happen if I pumped the maximum possible power for this system into the acoustic chamber. We set the voltage on the power supply to the maximum and look at the result. During frequency tuning, the glass bulb came into resonance and cracked, sacrificing itself for the sake of science. There is a fluid around, but the flask is still holding the fort. In the video, I leave the real sounds on this experiment. We observe the right piezoelectric element on the resonant chamber. At that moment, it cracked and flashes of plasma appeared on it. Judging by the testimony of power supply, the power of the surviving piezoelectric element is approximately 180 watts. At this stage of filming, I was sure that it was impossible to get sonar luminescence at home and there was nothing more to lose. I spent a lot of time, resources and sleepless nights since work at this experiment began after sunset. Aerodite glue does not withstand large vibrolots. Piezoelectric emitters had to be reglied several times, but now we are talking about a large acoustic chamber, which did not work properly at all. 
a further decision was to contact Sergei Matyushenko, who, like no one else, knew how the experiment should be conducted. As it turned out, he defended his thesis on this topic, so he kindly thought about all the nonsense during this experiment, and we are very thankful for it. So, the first thing we need is an accurate driving oscillator. For of these purposes, a frequency synthesizer on the AD9850 chip is perfect. At its output, we get a pure scene with an adjustment step of 1 Hz. The frequency range varies from 1 Hz to 40 MHz. But the amplitude of the sine output signal of the device is very small and equals only 2 volts. To amplify the signal, it is rational to use an audio frequency amplifier. In this case, a single channel class H amplifier is used on the TDA1562Q chip. For the operation of piezoelectric emitters, a high voltage is required, the source of which is absent on the circuit. One way to obtain it is to use an oscillatory circuit tuned to the resonance. In the circuit, piezoelectric emitters play the role of the capacitance. An inductor coil is a coil which can change its parameters when a ferrite rod is put into it. Here indications can vary from 8 to 50 mg depending on the length and permeability of the ferrite. I used a copper 0.68 wire wound in 8 layers. The presence of resonance will be determined by including a 1 ohm resistor in the circuit. When the generator frequency and the natural frequency of the resonance of the circuit coincide, the maximum voltage amplitude is observed on the resistor. It corresponds to the maximum current of the circuit, which in turn indicates the presence of resonance. This complete scheme for obtained single bubble sonar luminescence looks something like this. We start the installation and place a small air bubble with the syringe in the liquid. But how do you know the desired frequency at which a standing wave is formed inside the acoustic chamber? It is simple. Approximately, resonance is achieved when the acoustic wavelength is equal to the distance between the piezoelectric emitters. If we measure the diameter of our 100 mm tube, then it will be equal to 65 mm. It is just the length of the acoustic wave that is necessary for our calculations. The speed of sound propagation in water and zero temperature equal to 1,402.7 meters per second. Divide this figure by the distance between the emitters of 65 millimeters and get a frequency of 21.5 kilohertz. It is also worth considering the change in sound spread in a liquid with a change in temperature. When temperature is increasing, the speed of sound in a liquid increases, so the frequency also increases. So the calculation are made. We begin to select the frequency and observe how the signal changes on a 1 ohm resistor, which is connected in series to the circuit. Regardless of the frequency, the amplitude of the signal can be changed by introduction a ferrite rod into the inductor. Using a syringe, we place a bubble in the liquid. Piezoelectric emitters are glide with epoxy glide. Their centers are located on the same axis. The voltage applied to the surfaces of the piezoelectric emitters causes mechanical deformation. The greater the amplitude of the deformation of the piezoelectric element, which is transmitted to the acoustic chamber. Bjorkness forces affect on the microbulbs that have fallen into the chamber. If the ultrasound frequency is close to or equal to the resonance frequency, the bubbles will begin to move towards the center of the bulb. The bubbles will begin to move towards the center of the bulb. We wait until the bubble stabilizes and freezes in the center of the acoustic chamber. If the bubble jumps from side to side, we try to shift the frequency up or down. When we have achieved stability, 
Then we slowly increase the signal amplitude by introducing a ferret rod into the variable inductance coil. Here it is important not to do too much. Since the bubble can destabilize, which will lead to the disappearance of the glow, or it can completely disappear. If there is still no glow, try to add or to take a couple of millimeter of water from the acoustic chamber. Note that to reduce external influences, the fixing is to be made through a rubber gasket. All of these factors is one way or another affect the conduct of the experiment. One fine night. On about the 20th attempt to create the right conditions, I managed to get what we gathered here for. Sonar luminescence, a cavitation bulb, hanging in the central part of the flask, began to emit visible bluish light. It seemed something unattainable and truly amazing, a rare physical phenomenon that due to acoustic exposure generates light in a small air bubble. A flash of light accused due to a powerful ultrasonic wave in water. After all, a sound wave is an alternation of high and low pressure. And if the pressure decreases to such an extent that it becomes very negative, then the sound wave will literally rip the water and create a gas bubble. Just in the last moment of its collapse, when the temperature inside the cavitation bubble reached thousands of degrees, it emits a short flash of light. In our case, the bubble remains in place, contracting and expanding to the beat of the ultrasonic wave, and by emitting thousands of flashes per second, it generates a stable glow. Currently, there are thermal and electrical theories, which explain the mechanism of sonoluminescence. According to the thermal theory, luminescence occurs due to heating to high temperatures of the gases inside the bubbles when they are compressed and, according to the electric theory, electric charge exists of the surfaces of the bubbles when compressed. A gas discharge occurs in the gas inside the bubble, accompanied by luminescence. I'm too dumb to prove or deny these theories. We fixed the readings of the instruments. The calculated frequency was 22 kHz, and the actual one turned out to be 25 kopex, which is due to the complex shape of the structure of the acoustic chamber itself. In shape, it is far from being perfectly spherical. The voltage amplitude of the piezoelectric emitters at the time of observation of sonoluminescence was 34 volts. And this is at 12 volts at the input of the LC circuit, the power of resonance. Next, there was made a calculation of the power consumption of the device at the time of the birth of a neutron star. The audio frequency amplifier itself at idle consumes 100 mA, therefore we excluded. On different days of conducting the experiment, the current consumption during sonoluminescence was different, because the average power ranged from 1.5 to 3 watts. When it is possible to catch a stable bubble glow in the center of the acoustic chamber, it can be continuously absurd for several minutes. Let's try to repeat the experiment. In this case, a homemade dosimeter radio meter is used on the SBT-10 Mika counter. A very sensitive thing. We observe the readings on the screen of the device. The usual radioactive background in the CD can go up to 20 microrangan. Now there are 14 on the screen, which is normal. Within 10 minutes of measurements, it was not possible to fix the increase in radiation background. And this is due to the fact that the SBT-10 Mika counter is able to detect alpha, beta and gamma radiation and does not see neutron radiation. Inside the ionization chamber there are 10 parallel detectors, which quickly enough allows fixing the growth of the radiation background. To record natron radiation, special natron counters are used. This sample acquired specifically for the experiment did not work.
activated thallium scintillation detectors based on sodium yadid crystal serve are more advanced devices for detecting nature and radiation. In one of the next releases, we will show you how to create a gamma spectrometer on a sodium yodid crystal, which can not only detect radiation but also decompose it into a spectrum by which it is possible to determine what kind of materials is the radiation source. This is really cool. Now you will see something that has not previously been described in scientific papers. One fine night I managed to fix two bubble sonoluminescence, which like the stars in the sky were blinking. Well, I will make my tea and I will not interfere watching. For reference, the creation of this release took one and a half years. Many people write in the comments why the video on the channel is so rare. I answer, because if someone asks what benefit this experiment can bring, I answer, no benefit. You and I just gained experience in yet another craft. As they say, everything ingenious is simple. Ingenious is simple. Ingenious is simple.